Welcome to the first day of IFAB and the first live Q&A. Hope you've enjoyed the sessions which have come live so far. I'm Nancy Bixon. I'm the Managing Director of Chapel in York, and we are so thrilled to be hosts of this event and so proud of all the amazing speakers and the amazing conversations that you've already been able to listen to and are going to listen to um, in um, the next couple of days and forever afterwards. So thank you for joining us and thank you to our panelists for joining us. And I'd like to turn over to Craig Pollard, who is going to be the moderator for this session. Please do feel free to give any questions that you've got. That's what we're here to do. Um, and um, over to you, Craig, and thank you all very much for coming. Brilliant. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and thank you to the team at Chapel and York who've been working behind the scenes for months to bring these much needed conversations to life. Um, it's wonderful to see a, a Zoom room full of brilliant fundraisers with truly global experiences sharing their expertise. And it's fantastic to have seen so many um, of you conference attendees from all over the world. I hope you found the sessions challenging and that they're sharpening your global fundraising practice. And it's a privilege for me to be joining you from here in Okinawa, Japan. So we've heard a lot today about fundraising in Asia, Africa, and a bit about the Middle East. Um, we've only really scratched the surface of these incredibly diverse and vibrant fundraising regions. And this session is your chance to take a deeper dive into the specific issues that really matter to you with experts who are living and breathing fundraising um, in these regions. Now, please do submit your really difficult questions um, using the Q&A tab on the Chapel and York Connect, and I'll ask them on your behalf. Please do forgive me for paraphrasing them or adding specifics because these are very big regions. And if possible, please direct your questions to individual speakers. Uh, those that are a bit more general will be put out to everyone. So uh, first question is from Stephen. Thank you for this. Um, and this is for Liza. How do you see the recent political changes and unrest in Hong Kong and between China and its neighbors affecting how foreign fundraisers and donors engage with the region? And can you give some indicators on how you see future trends in the region? Uh, thanks, Craig. I, I feel like I need a, a you know crystal ball, but let me let me give it a let me give it a shot. Uh, so actually, at the start of this year, uh, we were already seeing some uh, concern about travel to Hong Kong. Um, so the the protests and the the um, the clashes have been going on for quite a while. Uh, it's not a really a new phenomenon uh, happening in Hong Kong. So um, we we had already seen you know uh, in November and December of 2019 a real reticence on the part reticence on the part of some uh, international fundraisers to travel to Hong Kong. Um, the city shut down. There were some issues with public transportation. Um, so you know at NPU we have around 40,000 alumni across Greater China, which includes Hong Kong. Uh, we have a very vibrant alumni chapter there. Uh, we actually instituted a help desk essentially for alumni who were hoping to come back to Singapore. Uh, so it was a really tough and challenging time for those of us who, you know, had prospects or had work um, in Hong Kong. Uh, the last time I traveled there was in December of 2019, um, and the city was changed. So I think, you know, for those of us who um, anticipate continued work in Hong Kong, uh, we have to kind of uh, start back at, at ground zero. So really starting to build up our, our, our alumni network, starting to build up our partner network. Um, you know, our, our, our long-term partners are still there. Uh, so I think, you know, the opportunities are absolutely still there. The changes and challenges are going to be uh, to continue to, to multiply. Uh, so for those folks who aren't as comfortable in a Chinese, uh, very Chinese heavy environment, um, I would suggest that, uh, you uh, take a step back and really focus on what the, the reasons are that you're going to Hong Kong. Um, it's a fantastic city, fantastic uh, networks into China, uh, but take a step back and, and really uh, understand why you need to travel there um, and what the, the prospects are for you there. So maybe Dave or Usha might have another uh, take or a different slant on the same question. All right, I'll... I'll uh, uh give my point of view. While Hong Kong is a great uh, gateway to China, uh, we must uh, understand the geopolitics of it. And uh, sometimes having your inroads into China and actually building relationship, having people who speak the language, 
who understand the culture in mainland China versus that of Hong Kong uh, also makes a big difference. Um, so in the past, it was fine you know, to use Hong Kong as a stepping stone, uh, but um, China doesn't want <laughs> that, uh, you know, the way they see it. So if China is not a priority for you, well, yeah, sure. But if it is a priority, uh, you really need to have a China strategy um, as opposed to a Hong Kong strategy that kind of um, parachutes into China as and when. So that would be my, uh, you know, going forward and make sense. Um, whatever the geopolitics of the place, it's good to have friends in the place that you actually, you know, plan to work in, uh, whether it's China, whether it's any any other part of the world. Uh, so that would be my point. Thank you, Usha. Astrid, I think you had your hand up. Can you? Would you like to add yeah, to that? Yeah, I I, I want to add to this a little bit with a much even much more long time long term view. Um, one of the things that we see in China is that government is, uh, of course, becoming more and more restrictive. But at the same time, the interest of people to connect is uh, unbroken. It's the same. And you can have really, really good friends in China. And it's worthwhile to, uh, to uh, engage in these friendships to cultivate them. Because over time, my uh, view into the crystal ball is that uh, Hong Kong will very much look like China, like mainland China in terms of the le legislation, in terms of the various obstacles that foreign organizations will have to, and, and hoops that they will have to jump to, through. So I think in the very long term, it's going to look just the same. And therefore it's good to cultivate the friends now, but I would also caution uh, and say, you know, you need a China strategy and you need to know that you have to take the really the long-term view there because it's going to take some time until those, those friendships that you've cultivated will come to fruition. But they, I, I'm quite convinced they will because while the government is becoming more restrictive, many Chinese people, of course, are more and more interested in maintaining relationships with people outside of China. So, um, and I can tell you this, I have lived in China in the 1980s when it was a very, very different time. And back then, even this this way of Chinese people to connect with 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 different countries with other people with people with, with different worldviews was very very strong so I don't think this is going to change and the more the the, the government will um, try to um, manage this if, if, if I may call it so um, the more people will be interested to keep those relationships therefore um, make friends cultivate them but don't expect that this is uh, going to be generating significant amounts of money in the in the near future. If I may just jump in, uh, I did a case study in my session uh, Asia with Africa, uh, working with Africa, mm -hmm. and there, there was a case study of students from the international school, and I actually had interviewed them and I had kind of played it out uh, in the session, uh, and it's really about that linkages. Uh, there are different avenues, um, uh, you know, for foundations and stuff, but also international schools that are looking for projects. There are other ways to start that relationship. Yeah. Sorry, this is Leslie. Just one other point. I think Astrid is absolutely 100% correct. Um, but there are ways, like like Usha just mentioned, that you can get around some of those, those obstacles. NTU, we're lucky to have a China office. We actually have six different offices in China. Um, so there are ways that, that, that um, external organizations can work in China. It just takes, you know, some diligence. Yeah, I, 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 would, um, I would endorse everything that's been, that's been said. And just remember that when people are put into a situation of crisis, it's not in their control. And they still want to be connected. They still want to be um, associated. So it might be more difficult. It might be different. Um, but it's not a time to abandon a group of people. It's a time to work out how best to work with them, given the current situations. Uh, and as Astrid said, and Lucia said, looking at how it's going to look at moving forward, it's not going to return back to what it was and, and, what, it, and what many of us were, were used to um, in, in Hong Kong. So difficult, different, moving forward, but don't abandon a group of people who are deeply philanthropic and want to be part of uh, the programs that they've been involved with already. Great, thank you. I'm just looking at the questions, other questions that are coming in now. Um, so there's a question about um, 
uh, in the fundraising, this is uh, thanks to Madeline for sharing this. Um, in the fundraising for Asian organizations from North America session, um, there she wants to hear more um, about raising funds um, as, a, as a foreign fundraiser and thinking about um, beyond uh, sort of university stories, so sort of uh, maybe charity examples, how, we, how to raise funds from individuals and particularly foundations in the US if you're based in Asia. We, we were in exactly that situation based in Singapore and looking at um, how we could generate uh, philanthropic support globally, um, having a, a, a very global footprint with our organization. One of the things that I found was really useful was looking at some of the American um, databases, which um, by, by law in the US, everything is public knowledge and there are companies out there that have um, consolidated that data. I could do research on who has given a philanthropic gift to Singapore, who has given it to education, who has given it to a school. And I think building up um, an understanding uh, uh, in the US, uh, that, that was a very good starting point for people who are already giving in the region. Anup. Yeah, thanks. So uh, if uh, another way which we have found to be very successful with uh, several nonprofits uh, in Asia is uh, diaspora fundraising. So there are uh, big diasporas uh, of Asian people in the US. And that works very well, working with this smaller niche community. Uh, so in India, there are uh, very big fundraising organizations like CRY and uh, Pratham, who raise lots of money uh, in uh, the US. And similarly, there are many others. There are Indonesian NGOs mm. uh, and Filipino NGOs who are raising money abroad. Uh, in India, there's a big one called India uh, America Foundation, America India Foundation. And uh, uh, very recently during uh, the COVID uh, lockdown period, there was a telethon on television and they uh, raised uh, close to 3 million US dollars. So I think that tapping the diaspora community is another way. It's an interesting um, audience that I think a lot of um, diaspora uh, audiences are um, very common audience and they, they tend to be oversubscribed uh, in many ways and actually breaking into diaspora um, communities can be quite difficult. Does anybody, can anybody of our panelists and speakers talk um, to some of the challenges of engaging diaspora communities? Um, I, I think it's important, definitely, certainly I work um, at Spelman College, which is um, an, a college that is specifically geared toward African-American women. Um, I think it's definitely important that if you're working with specific groups that you, you really get to know the culture and really get to know their giving patterns and what motivates them, because that's gonna help you be even more successful. And going back to the, the previous question about uh, Asians in terms of tapping into individuals and foundations in the US, it really is important to have, if you know a contact within that organization, it's really important to, to know someone who can connect you with the right people in the US uh, across the board. So that's really important too as well. But I would say knowing the culture, understanding the culture, understanding, understanding the nuances in terms of how people give, why people give, what motivates them uh, will be extremely helpful to you. All right, thank you, Jesse. Uh, Usha, yes. Um, I would say, suggest also this person looks at uh, Give to Asia, which is a platform um, that's set up in the United States for specifically uh, corporates and individuals and foundations that want to give to Asia. And they have country officers uh, for Asia. So uh, do explore the Give to Asia uh, platform and other similar platforms. Uh, and as for going back to the diaspora part, uh, sometimes we look at diaspora as mass market. You may also want to consider looking at diaspora as major gifts mm. uh, because uh, you don't need like a huge you know, number of Indonesians or Indians or no. um, Vietnamese to, to be supporting you. You may need just three of them or four of them. So don't be, don't, when you think diaspora, don't think of the whole community. Uh, also look at it from your major gift. I mean, make diaspora st a strategy within your major gift plan. Yes, Salma. Yeah, um, uh, commenting on the diaspora thing, uh, I would like to uh, 
agree with what uh, Usha was saying because uh, diaspora is a big word, uh, word and uh, also uh, you have to be careful when talking to uh, a specific person from diaspora because some of those people uh, 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 might have lost a connection with the country. So uh, for them, uh, they don't have any emotional connection for the cause you are fundraising for, or any connection with the, with the, with the, with the country itself. So it's very important to really uh, do some research uh, before uh, uh, approaching anybody from uh, diaspora. And uh, I fully agree that it, would, it should be for, uh, for larger gifts, for, for uh, major donations. Okay, and, and and I think I think one of the things that in my experience with um, diaspora um, donations is, is that you have this sort of feedback loop from overseas and from home. So you have to make sure that the quality of the work that you're delivering is really good, because otherwise everybody's going to hear about it if it doesn't work out. So I think it's one of the things to be really conscious about. Um, so um, we've got another question here um, from the uh, from the philanthropist's perspective. Um, so Kumar has asked. Um, what are the most common mistakes that philanthropists make and how can we help them to avoid them? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that's a dangerous question, isn't it? Um, I mean, honestly, I think the number one mistake that we, I've sort of seen, um, and I work in the Arab region just to kind of contextualize uh, my experience a little bit, um, and also I'm, I'm a grant receiver from donors on the other side. Um, and many of the things that we try to work with our network uh, around, you know, making strategic decisions um, in kind of the philanthropic space and the giving space is to be a little bit um, engaged with the beneficiaries that you are making the philanthropy to so that it's less driven by what you believe your, you know, where you believe your philanthropy should go um, and really kind of understanding where the needs are and where the gaps are that you can maybe best fill. Um, so that would be one thing. And then just coupled with that would be um, to, to really trust the, you know, the local sense of, the, of, the, of your beneficiaries and the communities that you are giving to. So oftentimes I think we find philanthropists who, you know, obviously this is coming from a place of passion and it's coming from a place of goodwill, but it's very personally driven. And that's beautiful in one sense, but then it can sometimes um, you know, impede the, the, the kind of optimal impact that maybe you can make with your philanthropy. So I would just flag those two things. Great, thank you, Nyla. Yes, Astrid. Yeah, I also would like to say, I, I, I completely uh, uh, second what, what Nyla just said, that is totally true. But the other thing I think is also oftentimes forgotten is that uh, as philanthropists, the more strategic you are about what you do, and if you have your own strategy as to what you want to accomplish, and you set up your values and you know about your values, then it is not just a haphazard decision because somebody has approached you, but it is it's something that will over the long, in the long term give you the satisfaction of doing something that really uh, um, uh, congeals with the values that you have set for yourself. And so to, to look out whether you, have, you share values much more than whether you share, you know, an idea about what should be done somewhere is an important thing for philanthropists to do. And it might make the whole experience much more uh, satisfactory, really. Thank you, Astrid. Karen. Hi, everyone. Um, sort of in agreement with both Nyla and Astrid, and so just not to repeat, but to emphasize, um, as philanthropists, I think, I would encourage more thinking in terms of partnership rather than simply donation. Um, in other words, working, as Nyla said earlier, working with the community to, to frame whatever the philanthropy is supporting and to make sure that it meets the needs of the philanthropy and the organization community project that is being funded. Um, and it's not, uh, it's, it's strategic as Astrid pointed out, not simply because funds are donated and left, but funds are a part, a small part, perhaps, maybe not small, but a part of the support that is coming from the philanthropist to whatever work is being supported. Thank you, Karen. 
Yes, Jesse. I just wanted I just wanted to add on to what oh, what everyone has said. I, I think you can also use this as an op, as an opportunity um, to educate. So I, I think that there's an opportunity to educate folks with this too as well, in terms of because they may not know what they can do. And so it really is an opportunity for us as an organization to educate them because by educating them, they, they could do so much more with their gift or help so many more people. And so I think uh, it's, it's an opportunity to really kind of educate them in terms of what they don't know and how they can make an impact. Did I see Adrienne, did I see your hand up? Please do share. I think, I think the whole around the whole issue of reporting, um, it's very important that the, that the philanthropist understands the actions, the outcome, the impact of, uh, of their gift. But it's maintaining a balance between uh, having rigorous reporting and reporting that becomes burdensome to the organization, uh, particularly where ch charities themselves are, are cash strapped and then they find themselves having to spend um, quite a lot of the donation on reporting. So I think there is a, a, that balance um, to strike particularly with the larger grant making organizations. Okay, great. Thank you. Norma, I saw your hand up as well. I think this is maybe the last one, then we'll move on to the next question. Yeah, hello. Um, well, I am from a different region of the world, from Latin America. So just adding on to what everyone has said, um, what we also, and agreeing with everyone, uh, a suggestion is that, for example, we run congresses for NGO um, for fundraising, and we try to encourage philanthropists to take part in the Congress so that they can mix up with the NGO people and understand better their needs. Uh, so that could be one of the, of the aspects and inviting them and, and interacting uh, more with the NGO uh, sector. Uh, that would be just a concrete suggestion. And just to add on the previous question on the diaspora, sorry, but uh, I also think apart, adding on again on what everyone said, an important issue with diaspora, at least for Latin American countries, is having uh, good platforms and payment methods. Uh, not every country, I mean, and that's a huge problem in many countries. It's a more technical thing, but sometimes it doesn't, enable all the possible donations. So sometimes you have to look at that as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, a, a more, we've got a, a more general question from um, Caroline, um, which is talking about sustainability and how do we sort of, um, you know, donors want to know that the money they'll give will have a, a long lasting impact. Um, how do we how do we balance um, balance this and, and manage uh, the expectations of donors about about how long sort of sustainability can realistically be funded for? Uh, Anup, please. Well, I come from a school which uh, is uh, small amounts from many, you know, small donations from many. Uh, so uh, my role allows me to work with the countries at the stage of nascence and bringing them to sustainability. So I can share my formula uh, that uh, I've been using. We try to get 80% uh, our resources from uh, smaller gifts and that to regular gifts. And uh, those uh, gifts uh, donors uh, do not ask many questions. You know, they need taste, uh, success stories, videos and all. Uh, and you have to have interesting engagements with them, which is lots of work but uh, they do not ask you many questions, but that is kind of uh, un mark money. And then 20%, rest of the 20 and maximum 25, we try to get from corporations and uh, major gifts and uh, other uh, sources. So that's, way, that's the way we are able to, you know, if a major donor comes in and says, how, how far sustainable your organization would be or how far sustainable this project I'm funding, uh, would be, we would say, okay, you fin uh, fund it for first three years and then through other smaller donations, we will continue this project uh, till we find another one. So it would be sustainable. And as far as our organization is there, uh, once we, when a philanthropist asked for it, we recommended a challenge fund, you know, okay, 
uh, why don't we use your money to bring in more donors, smaller donors? So that's been my formula. I don't know whether it answered the question that that came up, uh, but nice. uh, that's what we've been yeah. doing. Great, thank you, Anna. Yes. Lily, welcome. Hi, can you add to that? Yeah, uh, I'd like to contribute. So for us, what is working? Because donor, like for us, we are working in projects. So projects have a fixed time frame. So by the donor is asking, what is the guarantee that when I give you money post funding that this project will be sustainable? So what we've been doing for us is working with um, government institutions because government is there and most of the governments are already doing what you're already doing. So our work as NGOs is basically just supplementing what the government is doing. So what we do, we work with government such that they are part of their whole part of the, we get buy-in from the government we are able to also work with the communities to build their capacity so that even post, post donor funding, they are able to continue the, the, the projects that we are doing. But having government buy in so that once we are done with the project, the government literally takes over and they continue. But they have, we have to sign MOUs with them and then agree that uh, this is a project, this is what you're doing. That's why from inception, you have to involve uh, government and the communities to understand the bigger picture so that when you leave, they're still able to continue. And mostly the, we found the working with government actually works because they have the machinery, they, they have the money and they're seeing that you're already contributing to, to what um, they are, they are trying to do. So it's easier to hand over to government because government will be there even tomorrow, but organizations, they come and they fail. So working with government for us has really worked and getting the community even to contribute. So for example, if we are doing a project, we ask the community to contribute, let's say 20% um, in terms of construction materials. So the sustainability, then there's also ownership because they feel like They've been part of the project and they were not just handed over the the project so that those two strategies have worked for us great thank you lily um russell i think i saw your hand up briefly there um hi thanks <clears throat> it was actually the earlier uh, question um and maybe i'll just sort of link link the two uh so the, the first point I wanted to make is that um, when you speak about uh, philanthropy or philanthropists, uh, it's not uh, uh, homogeneous. It's, it's, it's very important to, to distinguish. You get different kinds of philanthropists and you get different kinds of philanthropy. Uh, and so you have to decide. Uh, in fact, I, I want to sort of flip this a bit. It's not so much about mistakes that philanthropists make because they make countless mistakes. Uh, I've been on that side. Uh, it's actually the mistakes that we make ourselves as the organizations looking for funding. If we're not clear about what we want, what our objectives are, and if, and if there is not sort of integrity uh, in, uh, in terms of our mission, then we often find ourselves in those kinds of problems. And philanthropists actually of, of all kinds really respond to that. They, they respond to an organization knowing what it wants to do, uh, being clear about its uh, objectives, and the ability of organizations to actually say no, which is often very tough, but I think that is what earns you respect and credibility. And yeah, that's a good point that uh, Russell's making, if I can, can, can add something to that. Mm, when do. the question was asked, it, it, it suggested that fundraising is the goal of all, all the work that we do. But in, in your question, you talked about impact and, and sustainability, but those are two different things. Eh? We talk about financial sustainability. That's a fundraising question. But if we talk about impact, fundraising might be a, you know, a, something that adds to, to, to reach the goal, but it is, uh, you know, it, we always have to look at the most cost-effective way of doing or work in implementation of our work. So when the donor asked you this question and how you formulated uh, uh, your question to us, and you're actually surprised by that question, something is already wrong with your programming. We, we expect our clients to think about the impact of the work before they start thinking about uh, fundraising. So they can never be caught off guard here. If that happens, I, I would really uh, worry about the programming and, uh, and go back to the, to the drawing table.
Thanks. Um, Brad, I saw you nodding vigorously there. Do you have something to add to that? Oh, I would say the, you know, going back to the, the earlier speaker, I think understanding who you are and all of these sort of answers is critical, but, um, you know, the ability to say no, whether you're as a philanthropist or as an organization to donations that don't quite fit your mission to me is a great way to not only gain credibility, uh, but also to sort of internally refine who you are and what you will and won't do to earn philanthropic investment. So, um, you know, to the extent that that you're institutionally or organizationally confident enough to refuse uh, engagement or donations, I think um, I think in, in sort of as a, as a sort of meta answer across all of these um, these questions to me is is, a, is a, a decent piece of advice. So I was echoing some of that as well. Yeah. Okay. No, it's great, and I think it takes a certain level of, of confidence to say no, but but it it saves organizations a huge amount of time um, chasing the wrong sorts of donations and the wrong sort of quality of donations. So it's it's a great strategy for actually um, making your fundraising hours work harder for you as well. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, sort of pull us up um, a little bit out of the detail and think um, there's a the question here, which is um, if if we could sort of provide say one or two things that are the most important practical things that any global fundraiser can do to focus um, or to sharpen their global fundraising in Asia. Um, what, what would those one or two things um, be? So uh, if someone uh, was part of the session where I spoke, uh, Asia is a very wide continent and uh, the largest continent in the world. And uh, Middle East is not really considered part of uh, Asia. It's a uh, club with North Africa, so the Arab one. So broadly, there is in Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, these two. And sometimes Australia is also uh, kind of uh, put into it with Pacific. But I, I will speak about South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, these are uh, countries which are very different, different religion, people look different, they eat differently, and uh, the culture is totally different. So it kind of varies from uh, each country to the other. At the same time, what is very important to understand is uh, there are three kinds of markets. and This is very common to other regions also. So there are uh, countries like Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, these five are developed countries, like they, they developed ones. Then there are the middle income ones like uh, India, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand. And then there are the ones which uh, are underdeveloped like Laos, Cambodia, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh is now emerging and Sri Lanka, like uh, not really fundraising markets uh, in traditional sense. So it depends on the, where you are targeting. So if you are targeting in Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, then uh, you have to go uh, with lots of investment funds because there's lots of competition. When you come down to grade two, there uh, again, you need lots of investment funds uh, because the market is, uh, is not saturated, but uh, the giving culture is uh, still uh, taking shape. And the third one is largely for grants and uh, philanthropists. So it's an uh, application market then raising. So I think this uh, thing needs to be very clear uh, at the beginning. Then there are uh, tips and tricks uh, that can follow, but I would say this is basic. Thank you. I think, yeah, I think I think the diversity of the regions we're talking about are so huge um, uh, that it's 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 an important distinction um, that we're talking even even within countries. Um, and, and I think uh, taking a very tailored major gift approach to all of our global fundraising is is the only way, um, uh, in in my experience. So, um, does anybody else want to want to talk about this uh, in terms of just just two or three quick uh, ideas and things that that global fundraisers really need to focus on in Asia or in Africa. Uh, this is Liza. Hi, Liza. So, yeah, so we actually covered this in our session, uh, Jesse and I. Um, be authentic. So um, it doesn't matter if you're in Bangkok or Beijing or, or Singapore or, you know, Shanghai. Be authentic, be, uh, be who you are. Um, make donors realize that this is a new relationship for you. 
um, understand that they have things that they're proud of uh, and show interest and enthusiasm uh, when they're showing them to you. So I think, you know, being authentic, we got into this business for a reason. It's to learn new things, meet new people, be open to those possibilities and you're going to do great. So I agree totally with uh, Liza and, and, and what I would add is have total clarity on your story, on your case for support, on your why, what are you actually trying to achieve as a, what need are you fulfilling and why should people uh, look at you as an organisation that can resolve that need? So total clarity on your case for support, on your story. Uh, yes, it needs to be looked at through different lenses, through, uh, as Anup said, different cultures will have different ways of looking at things, but you need to be absolutely crystal clear on your story. Astrid, can we come to you next? I also just I have to say from, from experience just in, in interacting with people in Asia, it's important to be positive. Don't come with a big crisis idea here, you know, and, and say, oh, the world is going under. Be positive. Be positive, friendly, forward-looking. It's a very simple piece of advice, but it goes a very long way. And uh, when we tend in, in Western Europe in particular, we tend to be very serious and you know, we make it very difficult and very, 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 very downturning and whatnot. This is not the way to approach people in Asia. And I think for, in, in many regions of Asia, and I think this is one of the, the small pieces of advice, but I think it goes a real long way. Yes, Karen. Well, first I'll agree again with Astrid. Yes, be positive, be um, optimistic. I think donors do want to fund an ongoing concern. Um, but as far as a question you'd asked before, Craig, about sustainability, um, I wanted to mention that increasingly in my work across the con continent, we're talking about income generating activities as a, a side to, uh, to whatever social justice or development work we're, we're doing. Many of the organizations that I'm working with are setting up different sized um, income generating components to, um, to, to help with the sustainability, to help answer the sustainability question that is often asked by donors. The nature of our work is such that um, we're probably always going to be dependent on, on donor support to some extent, but with, with a, a, I think a couple of Planned Parenthood Association of Ghana has a printing press that is doing, or a printing, uh, a printing office that is doing printing work for the community, doesn't generate uh, perhaps more than 10% of the operation, the required operational support, but it does, it does indicate a, a desire to be a part of supporting the organization's work. Did I see another hand up there? Yes, Usha. Yeah, I, I mentioned this in the session that I did. Um, I started as a fundraiser raising for Asia from, uh, you know, Western Europe, the United States. And one of the things that really irked me was the fact that the narrative was held by the guys who were raising the funds rather than the people actually working on the ground. Uh, and it was from their lens that they look at the way things are happening, which was really not true. Uh, I mean, there was a bit of it, but, you know, to use a bad word, they were trying to spin it <laughs> just so that they can raise the money. And uh, now that it's 30 years since that time, and I'm like raising in Asia for other, and, and so on and so forth. That's one tip I want to give any fundraiser that's raising for the country, you own the narrative. You tell it, and that goes back to the whole authentic part also. You say it as it is. Uh, and then if the donor is, well, you know, and try to educate the donor rather than um, kind of sell your soul just so that you can raise the money from another, another region. Uh, so for me, that's like the one tip I would say, uh, let the, the, organization that is receiving the money tell you what the case for support is and then you build on that and make it nice and refined but don't just impose your point of view on the organization that actually needs the money and that's actually doing the work on the ground 
Thank you, Michelle. I think you've got a lot of thumbs up for that. And actually, I just want to move on to another question we've had, which is from Madeline, which, which is related to this issue, which is about um, the, the sort of movement of power um, within fundraising and within big INGOs um, towards the global south. Um, and, uh, you know, which means that donors are, are, are less in control and that they, they, they're, you know, the voices of within the global south are driving fundraising agenda. Um, what, what how how are donors reacting to this um, in Europe um, and the US uh, when they're funding a Asian and African and Middle Eastern organizations where the where the power is being um, decisions are being made in the global south rather than traditionally and historically in the global north? Uh, they don't like it. Uh, they've been used to, as uh, Usha mentioned, spinning the narrative. Uh, so we kind of. Uh, are uh, grappling with this challenge because, you know, like the countries, for example, the ones I handle, 10, 20, 25% of the funds only come from the, uh, you know, European and North American markets. Rest all is uh, raised here. And the boards who were, you know, being given this lip service all this while, the board should be strong, they should take local decisions closer to the programs. Uh, they, they have started doing it. And so, uh, you know, uh, there are instances where there are conflicts. So uh, this is uh, just to give you the bad news first. Uh, the good news is, uh, you know, like, <laughs> they, 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 uh, the donors are also thankful because then they can move to the least developed countries. Then these uh, markets that can raise money, they're really thankful that uh, their loads are uh, getting lesser and uh, they can uh, uh, you know, take money to other markets and uh, uh, get more bang for the buck. Liza, yes, please. Yeah, Anup is spot on. So uh, it's a concern when the narrative is so focused uh, north-south. I think the, the biggest thing that we've seen is, you know, philanthropists are looking for impact. So you, if you're able to show that this, this project that a professor or a group of students is working on impacts XYZ community uh, in Cambodia, you're gonna find a philanthropist who's interested and keen to fund that. So again, making sure you show interest, um, maybe outside of the rich country that you're coming from and being able to show the sustainability aspect of it, I think is gonna go a long way in, in putting to, to rest some of those concerns that the philanthropist might have. Okay, thanks Liza. Nyla, I saw your hand up too, please. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to, I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is the, the person posing the question saying that there is a trend where the narrative is being driven by the global south? No, I think there's, there's I think in international development, there's been a major shift over the last sort of, even over the last 20 years um, from, um, well, actually probably longer than that, um, from uh, fundraising being controlled um, by northern offices of African organizations. Um, and that has, has been shifted. So you see the, the big INGOs, CARE, Oxfam, et cetera, shifting their headquarters south um, and, and, and really starting to push power and decision-making to the organizations and the communities that are directly benefiting from this. So that's the, the sort of trend that I think we're talking about here. Okay, because that has not trickled down to my region. I can tell you that right now. Where are you based, Nina, please? <laughs> in the Arab region. Um, that is not the story in the Arab region. There is, there, I mean, no, I don't see that the narrative is being, um, that we're allowed to own it by any means. On the contrary, I mean, I think it's, uh, it, it gets even more and more driven. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I'm, you know, maybe I need to move, <laughs> but that's, well, that's but, interesting. But it's the there's also a point about how, how real this is without so when 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 um when when everything's being funded by USAID by CEDA by uh, by <laughs> by Swiss aid Irish aid etc um how independent can these southern led organizations actually be but I'll I'll, I'll leave that um, well I mean I think there. that depends you know it depends on on the on the on the what's the driving force for the donor to fund that region in the first place right that's the mm. person you should be asking or the entity that exactly. should be asked yeah. Yeah. Okay. Craig, um, Craig, if I, yes, please. If I could just mention in the in the session we um, we had in, on Asian organizations doing fundraising in uh, in Europe, we had as a guest uh, Brac, one yeah. of the largest NGOs in the world, complete uh, 
founded and, 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 and still active uh, uh, enormously in Bangladesh, they are able to raise a billion uh, US dollars per year, if not more, uh, from Bangladesh. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think if, if this discussion is about, you know, can certain organizations do this? Can, can certain organizations take leadership? And, and I, I think that's totally the wrong discussion uh, because they've proven that they can do it. From Bangladesh, you have Amref in, in, uh, in, in Africa. Many, many examples of organizations that have proven they can do the fundraising themselves from, uh, uh, from the global south, if you want to call it. They, they are excellent in programming. And actually, the shift that you see is that quite a big uh, number of foundations, they are opening now offices themselves in Africa and in Asia to be closer to these organizations. You mentioned USAID. They are moving these big grants from, from the US way more uh, into these countries because they see there's a lot of impact. And I think that creates, of course, problems for the northern organizations, if you, if you will, if they cannot demonstrate added value to the programming. And that's, of course, a big problem that many NGOs have. If you really want to uh, look into the added value that they have, well, they can accept grants and they can re-grant it to, to their partners. But if that is your only added value, then, then why would you leave 10, 15, 20% of overheads with these organizations? It, it doesn't add value. So, uh, yeah. Um, I can't believe it's taking us uh, 50 minutes to get to this subject, but I, I feel like it would be um, remiss of us to um, to not talk about uh, why we're uh, not all actually sitting at the same table and about to um, announce uh, drinks at the end of the, uh, the the conference for everyone to go to. But um, so I, I want to talk about a bit about COVID briefly and just and just really think um, about just ideas about what you know global fundraising has been extremely challenging over the past um, year. And it's if that's likely to continue over the next year or two at least. Um, uh, never mind the sort of economic impact of, of that of, of the pandemic as well. And I just want to really just explore two things, which is what what might the the, the sort of normal, the new normal of global fundraising look like? Um, uh, when can we expect it? And uh, and and how can global fundraisers prepare uh, prepare themselves for this? Brad. Sure. So, um, first of all, it's a terrific question, and we're all living this uh, this um, pandemic um, similarly but differently. I think the force is converging, and again, I wanted to jump in on a conversation, a question earlier. You know, a, a shift in control from the north to the south is going to be driven by the ability for southern organizations to acquire data and run, you know, the the Duflo Banerjee style double blind studies on impact on the ground. So if your organization can demonstrate that impact, you will attract not only resources, but control. What that means in the area of COVID, where we're all been forced to engage on these virtual platforms, which a yeah, drink with everybody here would be lovely, but unfortunately that's not possible. Um, but this platform combined with uh, an organization's ability to attract data opens the entire globe to your fundraising apparatus, not just in in terms of engaging with individuals through, you know, whether it's direct uh, email or blah, 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 but actually bringing them onto the ground. Um, and if you want to give a major philanthropist or foundation or a corporation uh, social responsibility director into an authentic discussion, if you can combine uh, distance technologies, telepresence technologies with real data and your program directors on the ground, again, uh, taking the issue that Usha points out off, off the table and allowing donors to engage with the people they want to engage with anyway, the, either the people you're supporting or the, or the people who work for you. Um, to me, this, this trend is being accelerated by COVID and I don't see it going away. In fact, I see organizations who double down on it being the winning organizations long-term. Thanks, Brad. Does anybody else want to, don't want to weigh in on that? Norma, please. Yeah, hello. Um, about uh, the current COVID um, um, issue and uh, what will happen next, I think that, uh, of course, uh, digital is uh, something that has already begun for many, many years ago, and it, it came to, to stay. And actually, I think it's a huge playground, and I don't believe so much anymore in North and South. I think at the same time that there's a kind of old discussion with that uh, because the digital uh, playground showed that it doesn't matter where you are. If you do the right things, you can get donors from across the world. 
And honestly, in our region, sorry, I am from Latin America again, uh, the one of the, the most of the most innovative strategies have, for example, in Greenpeace, and we covered that, I think, in our session with Melanie from South Africa, uh, uh, have come from the Argentina office or from the Brazil office. So I think that the new normal uh, has a lot to do with your ability to be flexible, to be to grab all opportunities, to think outside the box, uh, the box, sorry. And I was thinking outside the box because uh, I would say that when we started doing individual giving in Latin America, almost 25 years ago or 30 years ago, at least in my case for UNICEF, we didn't have any books to read in Spanish about how to do individual giving. And we started with our own hand and marketing and, uh, and experience and it worked. And now here you have organizations that have 500,000 donors or a million thousand donors in Brazil or in Chile or in other places. And I think that's growing really big. So. I think there's a lot of local agendas going on and just the ability to be flexible, grab opportunities and be perseverant and very passionate. Anamia, sorry, can I just bring you into this? Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Craig. I, I, I agree with, with everything that, is, that has been said. You know, South, South Africa is, is probably the most, the country with the most inequality in the whole wide world. And I think COVID certainly has, has surfaced um, and very starkly shown how bad that really is. Um, there's been a research project here amongst NPOs here in South Africa, which um, gave the, the, the responses of NPOs to the, the crisis that they've been facing. And um, it's, the results were remarkably positive in that many of these NPOs thought that they and believed that their income would after three years be more or less what it was before the pandemic started. But I think what the pandemic has also taught us is and shown us is how organizations and people stand together. So I do think that partnerships, collaboration, solidarity, those are going to be a feature of the fundraising world going forward, which also means that you need to make sure that what you do, the why of what you do is very clear and that you don't necessarily duplicate or else if you do duplicate, join hands. Um, so that, that, that would be my sense. That's great. Thank you. Anna. Um, and Melanie, do you have something to add to this? Yes, I think as another South African, I would really endorse what Anamir was saying. Um, I have been really surprised by the optimism around COVID. I've been even more surprised by the generosity that we've seen during COVID. Um, I think it cannot last, though. Um, it, it will normalize, and I think we will certainly get a new normal. And I think certainly in countries like South Africa that is heavily dependent on their nonprofit sector, they're going to experience closures because it's those organizations with really strong programs, with really strong impact, who can tell their stories that are going to be the ones who get the attention. Um, and I think definitely, again, to, to absolutely endorse what Anamir was saying around collaborations and partnerships. I think it's, it's that that is going to be the hallmark of certainly the next few years. Great. Han. Yeah, so th that is all true, and um, uh, definitely COVID is going to, to to is already shifting things up uh, a bit. Um, there's one positive note I want to uh, to 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 add that COVID is bringing, and that is that we now have a level playing field. We uh, many of the speakers already mentioned how important it is to reach out to funders and 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 engage with them, mutual trust, share a vision. And normally, how that works is that you you know you try to get face to face contact. And that's difficult if you're based in Asia and you want to get funding from a US foundation, what option do you have? You have to take a plane, go to New York and meet with them. And that's very expensive. You can do it once per year, twice per year, maybe. And you're competing with organizations that are just around the corner of these funders and they can go there anytime and have a, have a cup of coffee. They meet each other at conferences, at networking events. So that's unfair uh, competition, if you, uh, if you want to call it. Now, 
we're all in the same place. Yeah, you see that in this group, we're all in the same group from, from all kinds of different continents. And this is also how we see our clients working with uh, uh, foundations. It's through Zoom, it's through uh, Microsoft Teams, it's Skype. This is how you engage now with, uh, with funders. And it doesn't matter if they're just around the corner or they're like uh, 2000 miles away because everyone is working from home using their computer at the moment. So this moment is a great opportunity if you want to enter a new market. It's the most cost-effective way. I think the, the timing is in that sense, perfect. Not easy, but uh, this is a good moment to start engaging in different uh, regions. I think that's, a, um, that's an absolutely fantastic uh, sort of sentiment to end on. I'm very conscious that we're, we're at the end of our time. Um, and I, I think it's true. I think um, there's a sense that there are, as well as COVID bringing a huge range of challenges, um, there are some spectacular opportunities uh, for those who are sort of brave enough um, to, to take that step. Um, I just I just want to say a huge thank uh, thank you to all uh, of our speakers who have joined us today um, and to all of the conference attendees too who've asked questions and I hope this session has been helpful. If you didn't quite make it, if we didn't quite make it to your question, I'm sorry, but um, please don't be shy. Feel free to chase up any of us up uh, afterwards and ask any of the speakers questions directly through Chapel and York's Connect. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you to the speakers again. Thank, thank you to the attendees for joining us. And I hope uh, you thoroughly enjoy the rest of this conference.